Okay. Awesome. Sometimes it lags a little bit, so I don't... Oh, there we go. We are live. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Amber Rose, also known as the Religious Hippie. If you uh, don't follow me already, you can basically follow me on any social media platform. Um, and today I have a special guest with me. I have Emmanuel Gonzalez, better known as Manny. And as you guys saw in the title... We're talking about welcoming, but not affirming. So we're going to get into that, but a little bit about Manny. He is a speaker. He is a master's student, but most importantly, a son of God. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to him and he can tell you a little more about himself. Hey guys, thank you so much, Amber. Thank you for having me. I'm so thrilled to be with you guys. Um, even though I'm talking to you through your screen, I can't see you. I'm so glad you're here. Um, yeah. So as Amber said, my name is Emmanuel Gonzalez. Most people know me simply as Manny. Um, and as she was saying, I am currently a graduate student at Franciscan University of Steubenville, getting my master's in catechetics and evangelization. Um, I'm also a speaker. Um, specifically, I am very blessed to have the opportunity to travel the country and also internationally to share my firsthand witness of being a faithfully Catholic man, um, a devout Catholic man who experiences same-sex attraction, um, but is striving to live a life according to Catholic Church teachings on human sexuality. Um, and so I'm very blessed to be able to share just the joys and the sorrows and the pains and the glory of what this looks like to be someone in the church who has an LGBT plus experience, but is striving to live chastely according to church teaching. And um, it's a huge gift. I'm able to uh, work with Catholic bishops. I was recently inquired for Pope Francis's Synod on Synodality, um, work with all kinds of ministries and dioceses. And it's a huge gift. Um, but foremost, before all of that, as Amber said, um, I'm a man of God. I'm a son of God. That is foremost uh, where my identity lies. That is foremost what and who I live out of. Um, and it's a gift to just be able to share uh, with the church and with the world what that looks like, um, particularly for someone like me who um, experiences same-sex attraction but um, does not see it as any kind of impediment to sainthood because we're all called to sainthood. And I'm super blessed to be here today to just talk to you guys about that and to share in that conversation with all of you. So thank you for being here. And yeah, thank you, Amber, for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm so excited about this because I think it's a really important topic, especially today when we see how, you know, our world has embraced, you know, the LGBTQ type of um, culture in, in that sense. And it's not the right type of embracing, but we have a hard time, I think, as Christians really reaching those people in a way that's not going to turn them away, but also in a way that doesn't affirm. Um, and so I was wondering, could you go into a little bit about your story and and your own struggles and, and everything like that? Yeah, absolutely, Amber. Um, yeah, this, first of all, just a second, what you said, this is such an important conversation. Like church, we need to have this conversation. This is important. This is vital. Um, we have individuals in the pews who have LGBT plus experiences, who, who experience same-sex attraction. Like this, this exists in our church. Um, this exists outside of our church. And this is something that we as Christians, as followers of Christ, as Catholics, um, need to talk about. It's important. Um, so yeah, absolutely, Amber. I'm, I'm more than happy to go into my story and share a little bit about myself. So I was born in Dallas, Texas. Um, despite my my mullet and my earrings. I am a, I'm a proud Texan. I, I'm not wearing cowboy boots, but I say y'all. Okay. Um, but I'm a proud Texan, uh, cradle Catholic. Um, so I come from a very faithful Catholic home, uh, big Catholic home as well. Um, I have, uh, five siblings here on earth and one in heaven. Um, and then my parents are happily married. Um, they both growing up were very involved in the RCAA program at my parish. So for those of you who might not be familiar with that, it's basically the church's program for initiating or preparing individuals for initiation to the Catholic faith. Um, so the reason I say all this is just to get back on that. I was raised on the Catholic faith. Like I always growing up knew who Jesus was intellectually. Um, obviously within my heart, I didn't know him. Um, I was actually very scared of him, um, but intellectually I knew who Jesus was. And I was raised on the sacraments. Um, and so I had a pretty normal childhood, nothing, you know, irregular or anything like that. Um, and my story really, I think when it comes to sexuality and faith, um, you know, it kind of started in middle school, um, which is when I first started to come to realization that, you know, I went to an all boys Catholic private school. Um, and so while all my peers were talking about their girl crushes and their cooties, you know, just like puberty at its peak, like, you know, just throwing out all those, you know, like Britney Spears, Ashley Simpson, all these girls, I was here listening to them. And I was like, the way that you guys talk about these crushes of yours. I actually feel that way towards like my peers, towards like the other guys. 
And it spiraled me. It just freaked me out on being a, you know, a growing up faithfully Catholic. Um, it was scary and I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and very quickly it spiraled me into what I kind of describe as like a, a threefold just funnel of hatred. Um, I hated God or agreed to hate God because I thought that he somehow had messed me up, that somehow he had bestowed this upon me, um, my attraction to the man, that somehow he had like, he had broken me. Um, I hated the Catholic church because I thought that as an institution, she was calling me into something that was um, unfair and homophobic and unrealistic. Um, and then ultimately I hated myself because I thought that somehow I deserved this, that somehow I deserved this disgusting part of myself that I was so ashamed of. And so it really just buried me into deep isolation and self-hatred, um, which went on for many years um, throughout middle school and into high school. It actually got me to the point where I got kicked out of two different Catholic private schools. Sorry, I laugh about this now. But yeah, I because there was just so much suppression and isolation where I thought the way that I could cope was to make people laugh. I was like, if I can make people laugh, then if I can make my classmates laugh, um, then nobody would actually ask what was going on inside Manny's heart, what was actually going on internally. So I would just do all the pranks they asked me to do. I would play all the stunts. And it got me to the point where I got kicked out of two different Catholic private schools. Um, hadn't told my parents, didn't tell anybody. Um, I had this this plan, this master plan that I was like, one day when I go off to college, when I'm like 20 something, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to tell mom and dad. I'm going to be like walking to the car and I'm going to look back and be like, mom, dad, I'm gay. And I'm going to go into the car. We're never going to talk about it again. And that was my master plan, which obviously <laughs> as the story unfolds, it didn't happen that way, but um, we'll get to that. So I, I go through middle school and high school, again, just very uh, deep hatred, growing hatred for the church and for myself and for God. Um, eventually, it actually got to the point where my parents had to send me to public school in high school because I just they couldn't keep dropping money on me and just keep getting kicked out of schools. Um, and so I go to public school, and obviously, Catholic schools by no means are perfect. Sin still very much so exists in Catholic schools, um, but at least for the majority. Unfortunately, we have to say the majority, but for a majority of Catholic schools. Um, we know that they are just founded on like basic Catholic understanding, morality and social teachings and whatnot. Um, whereas when I went to public school, it was relativism. Anything goes. You live your truth. I live my truth. And I started getting introduced to just the world's idea of love and sexuality and freedom in that and what that looks like. And I still didn't feel the need to confront this part of myself. But nonetheless, I started observing and looking at my options. Um but then my junior year of high school, so I was around, I don't know, like 13, 14, uh, maybe older. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, I, that was when my parents found out. Um, and that was when really I think was kind of a, the climax of my story, the beginning of you know, my story really was um, my mom and dad. One day my dad just asked me for my phone very politely um, just you know, to make sure I wasn't doing anything I shouldn't have. It was a spontaneous phone check. Okay. And, been there right been there i know and like at the time i was like dad i hate you but now looking yeah. back i'm like thank god like yeah i'm like you know dad was protecting me and but anyway so i he he took my phone and on my phone i had a screenshotted conversation between me and a friend from youth group um this was a friend that i knew loved the lord i knew loved the church and she was the first person i ever told and um, I found these messages a while ago, and it's actually really sad. I, I remember I just messaged her, and I was like, I, I think I'm gay. I don't want to go to hell, and I know I'm disgusting, and I know God hates me, but I don't know what to do, and I, I don't want to go to hell, and I know you're Catholic. Please don't hate me. But I just I felt the need to tell her because I wanted to see your reaction. Um, and I remember the way she responded was so different than what I expected. Um, it was not a condemnation. It was not a – like nothing like that. It was a – like she just affirmed me in my identity in Christ. She was like, you are, you're loved. And like the church wants you and you have a place here. And, you know, she's not calling you to do anything that you're not capable of. And just this beautiful message I screenshotted because it was the first time that I'd ever heard that maybe God doesn't hate, you know, people within the LGBT plus community. And so I realized my dad was going to find that. So I sat my mom and dad down really dramatically. It was like, I, I'm Hispanic. So it's like, it was like telenovela moment. I was like tears, like, you know, sewage. <laughs> And I, I was like, your lives are never going to be the same. And they're both sitting there like, is this kid like a terrorist? Like, what is, what's going on? And I, I told him, I was like, mom, dad, this was the language I used at the time. But I was like, mom, dad, I, I think I'm gay and I don't know what to do. I don't know how you respond, but this is, you know, this is what it is. And that moment was truly, I think, one of the first tangible encounters of the father's love um, that I ever had 
because in that moment, my mom and dad did not condemn. So they didn't, you know, sit and, you know, you chastity or you're going to hell or, you know, pull out CCC 2357. <laughs> they didn't do any of that. But they also didn't celebrate it. They didn't pull out, you know, a, a rainbow flag and, you know, bring us home a son-in-law, like nothing like that either. Um, they actually said nothing. They just sat and my dad just held me while I was crying. And it was very just reflective of the father that he meets us in our brokenness. Obviously, he doesn't let us stay there, but father meets us there. And dad just held me. Mom was standing behind him and I was just crying. And they just let me be a mess in front of them. And then that was it. And then I just walked out. And a couple of days later, my dad, very respectfully, he, he was like, you know, the awkward kind of dad, like, hey, uh, want to talk about what happened the other day? And um, so I went to a priest. Um, it was completely consensual. It was a family friend of ours. Um, he was very kind about it. But basically, this priest kind of just told me, like, what the church teaches and what my life would look like moving forward if I, you know, being a Catholic. And uh, I hated it. I was like, this sounds so boring. And the church is not where I want to stay. And so once mom and dad, I found out, I was like, I have nothing to lose. Like now I'm a free bird. I can, I have nowhere to hide from. And so I started coming out to people, uh, my junior year of high school, left and right. It was like, everyone had to know, like I was, I was a gay man. I was gay. You had to love me for being gay. This is who I am. And um, I remember such a novelty thing to the point where like one time for my friend's birthday, that was her birthday gift. It was like, happy birthday. I'm gay. Congratulations. Like no, <laughs> no, no receipt, no coupon, no gift wrap. It was like, I'm gay. You're welcome. And it was like, it was just such a self centered, like, just like everyone had, like, it was like, it was who I was and you had to see me, you had to love me. And that was, that was it. And if you didn't love this part of me, you didn't love me. Um, senior year of high school, I was the gay kid at my high school. Um, my public high school, I started dating guys, started becoming sexually active with guys. Um, I actually started an LGBT plus Alliance club at my high school. Um, and then this continued into two years afterwards. My first years of college, I did a uh, community college back home in Texas. And I continued to just dive deeper. I started going to um, gay clubs, drag bars, got very involved in just the LGBT plus spaces in Dallas, Texas. Um, and it wasn't, whenever I told my testimony, I like to emphasize that it wasn't just homosexuality though i was involved in just a plethora of um just unhealthy habit and sin um i was drinking all the time i was smoking i was selfish i was prideful i was gluttonous i it was just i want to emphasize i lived a very sinful life but it was not solely because i was dating men like it was like i was just all about what i wanted how i wanted how i was going to get it and that was the life i lived um and when i tell my story i like to emphasize that I was not miserable, okay? Because sometimes when I hear people tell their stories of sin, it's like all like, oh, like, woe is me. I hated my life. It was, and you know, maybe that was their experience. But um, I'll be straight up, sin feels good. <laughs> if it didn't feel good, we wouldn't be committing it. And sex outside of its proper context as one man and one woman within the context of holy matrimony still feels good, even if it's outside of its proper context. Unfortunately, that is why a majority of the world does it. And so I'm not gonna sit here and say I was absolutely miserable like there were moments of happiness there were moments of pleasure um but it was fleeting because it wasn't joy there's a difference between joy and happiness joy has a name and it's jesus christ he's a person and i didn't i didn't know jesus um but i definitely had moments of happiness so i like to emphasize that but um anyway so i continue this way um there was definitely a lack of i i felt the disconnect between the father and i and i felt Definitely, there was a hole in my heart that that classic youth minister, you know, like that God shaped hole. I mean, it was true. Like my heart was really restless. Um, but again, I, I thought that this was the fix. I thought that this was what I needed. And this is how I was going to live my life. And this was the best I was going to get. Um, all the while, I was still going to church. I was kind of doing the Hannah Montana, best of both worlds. <laughs> to live. And it was just like, it, and I knew, like, there was a part of my heart that knew that something was off. Like there was a disbalance, there was a lack, there was a disharmony. Um, and then, um, summer of 2018, the Lord, um, spoke to me, um, very dramatically because he knows I'm dramatic and he was like, all right, I gotta, again, I gotta get to this kid. He meets us where we are. Um, but I had a dream, um, where I saw my heart and it was, it was like this heart of flesh. It was in this dark body water and it was sinking really, really quickly. And it was like sinking like a stone in water. And I realized that. It was like the Lord tore the veil and he allowed me to see just the depth of my sin. Again, way beyond homosexuality, just all the sin I was living in, pride, gluttony, you know, envy, all this thing. He allowed me to experience what it was doing to my soul and where it was taking me. And I knew it wasn't going somewhere good. 
Um, but how do you go from like, I received this message from the Lord and I was like, okay, Lord, I know you're calling me elsewhere, but how do I go from this kid who's like super involved in like the LGBT plus spaces in Dallas, like super active and all these, you know, different things to then like a Bible thumping Christian? Like, how do I do that? You know? And so honestly, I ignored the Lord. Um, I didn't answer him. Um, my parents eventually noticed that cause there was such a, the fa- when the father speaks to you, you can't just run away. And so there's such a, a restlessness and eventually, um, they kind of sat me down and, you know, asked me what was going on. And, um, they tried, you know, to support me and like living a faithfully Catholic life. And so I tried the Catholic thing for a few weeks. I, you know, I went to like different ministries and, you know, youth group and I tried to be Catholic and I was like, you know what? This sucks. Like I was like, Cassidy is so lame and I want nothing to do with this. And so I looked the Lord in the face. And despite him calling me home, I said, like, I want I want nothing to do with you. And I'm going to intentionally choose to walk away from you. And so summer of 2018, I lived the most wildly, promiscuously, um, just fleshly life I could. Um, I explored churches outside of the Catholic Church that affirmed me, that told me, like, it's okay if you're with a man as long as you love the Lord. It's okay if you're getting drunk every night as long as you love the Lord, all these things. Um, but I knew that there was not the fullness that I knew that there was something missing that I knew that the Catholic church had the fullness and had what my soul was made for, but I did not want to listen. I didn't want to go there. Um, and the Lord is such a gentle, patient father that he let me go off. He was like, you go off, you do your thing, prodigal son. I'll be right here whenever you want to come home. Um, and so then October, 2018, it happened again, very dramatic. <laughs> again, I tell a novella, the Lord is so he speaks to me, but, um, I had another dream. Um, in this dream, um, I heard two things from the Lord. Um, the first thing that I heard was like a, a very desperate, like a like a father to his son, like, son, I need you. Like, come home. I need you. Um, and the second thing I heard was time is running out. And so that night, I got on my knees and I prayed the first, I think the realest, most raw prayer that I've ever prayed. The first prayer that I really have ever prayed for the death of my heart. Where I said, Jesus... I was like, I have no idea who you are. Chris Tomlin says you're a good, good father, apparently. <laughs> like, I have no idea who you are. But Lord, if you are who you say you are, show me now. Give me, like, show up or else I'm going to, get, going to give the rest of my life to letting people know that you are a liar and that you are a hypocrite and that you are not real. And Jesus is faithful. And that night, things started moving. Grace started coming out um, very slowly, very gradually. <laughs> But the Lord heard and he answered. Um, my life started looking a little different. He started giving me the graces I need to start to back away from some social settings, some things that I was doing that were not obviously helping my pursuit of sainthood. Um, he started directing me towards different ministries, different um, resources that could kind of, you know, guide me as I tried to pursue a virtuous life, you know, living chastely, but also just living a life that was virtuous overall, as opposed to what I was living before. And um, I like to emphasize that it was not overnight. Um, I'm still ongoing it's ongoing conversion it's metanoia i'm still being worked on um but very gradually the lord started moving um i also like to emphasize i lost a majority of my community i would say about 95 percent of who i thought were my friends um were messaging me texting me you know you're brainwashed religion's got a hold of you you'll be back we'll see you again you know all these just like i lost everyone um it was hard i like to emphasize this was not an overnight conversion this was not an easy conversion i lost everyone i was alone for the like the first few months, it was very scary, but by the grace of God, he replenishes, he restores and the Lord made it all up and gave me an abundance, you know? Um, and by the grace of God, now here we are, um, this actually next month, this October, I was celebrating five years back in the Catholic church. Praise God. Wow. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, God. Thank you. Yeah. The Lord's very good. Um, um, and, and, you know, in these five years, what I've learned since being back is the goodness of living out of our identities as sons and daughters as beloved that first and foremost like the father looks at me he doesn't see his gay son just like when he looks at you he doesn't see his his heterosexual daughter his straight daughter like that's not the father doesn't look at any of us for any of those things like are the is that a part of me yes my sexuality is a huge part of my human experience our sexuality affects the way we relate to the world to ourselves to others um you know it's it's a huge part of my human experience i can't deny or ignore i i acknowledge i'm not suppressing i'm not rejecting like i'm attracted to men it's very obvious part of myself um but first and foremost at the root of who i am i'm a son of god i'm a man of god that is what i'm called to live out of that is who i'm called to be that's who i was made to be and so this past five years it's really been just an adventure of like pressing into that what does it mean to be a man of god what does it mean to be a son 
Um, it's been hard at times. You know what? The cross is heavy. Um, like there are splinters that come with the cross. Uh, it's hard. There are moments when I fail. There are moments when I fall, um, whether it's in chastity or in other areas of my life. Uh, it's not easy. Like I get lonely at times. Like, you know what? Newsflash, being in a relationship isn't going to fix that. You know, like it is hard. But at the same time, the cross is the bridge to the resurrection. And I've experienced resurrected life in a profound, tangible way that I can truly test that being in the Catholic Church, living an authentically Catholic life, I've never felt more free. I've never felt more alive. And I've never felt more at home that the Catholic Church is my home. The Catholic Church is our home. Um, church teachings on human sexuality are good. They're worth being pursued. They're not impossible. The Lord equips with grace. Um, it's not easy, but it's good. Um, and so now I give my life by the grace of God to testifying to that, to the joy of in um, a few months into my conversion, I had this image of a book opening up. And I realized it was the Lord telling me to share my story. So that Christmas, I asked for a Canon camera. And then January of 2019, I posted a YouTube video where I didn't know what I was going to say. I didn't know how it was going to go, but I told my testimony. Um, and very quickly, it gained steam. I started realizing like more and more people are reaching out to me from all over the world, all over the church, you know, expressing that. You know, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only Christian mm -hmm. or Catholic who you know, had an LGBT plus experience, who wanted to pursue chastity, who wanted to pursue the church teachings, who wanted to follow Christ. But I thought I was alone. I thought I was the only one who wanted to do this. And I felt isolated, but I saw hope in you. And so I started posting more videos about my experiences. Eventually started a ministry, a public ministry that now it's this day by grace of God. Like, like you're saying, I'm able to speak nationally and even internationally, work with all kinds of people in the church, all kinds of ministries. And it's a huge gift. Um, and I guess I'm here to just speak hope that if you are a Catholic or a Christian who experiences same-sex attraction, like you are not alone. Like there are so many of us more than people realize within the pews who desire sainthood. And the saint is calling you to saint. Uh, I'm sorry. The church is calling you to sainthood. The Catholic church wants you to be a saint, is calling you to be a saint. And you are not exempt from that call through virtue, through chastity, through humility, through like everyone else is called to. It might look different for us. It does look different for us, but it's still good and it's worth the sacrifice in yeah all glory be the lord's and i'm so thankful to be here to testify to that today with you and to the world and to all your listeners so yeah wow the very good so <laughs> no that's a beautiful story and i think it's one we need to hear more of especially today when you know people are being fed the whole you know what you what you were being fed basically like this is my truth. This is what I want. It's, you know, and then parents are told, like, if they don't affirm their children, their children are basically going to die or yeah. something. And, yeah. you know, and it's such a mixed up world. And seeing how, you know, same sex attraction has kind of, you know, impacted your life and things like that. What are like some ways that um, we can reach the people without being like preachy or like, what would you have needed um, during that time? Yeah. I mean, great question. Um, I think um, first and foremost, as Christians, something that I need, but also something that, you know, now being in this ministry for three or four years and just encountering so many individuals within the church and also outside of the church who came from Christian homes, came from Catholic homes who have since left the church. And yeah, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who have been wounded by the church and people within the church and, um, I think first and foremost, I think what's really sought after that's just not as present as it needs to be with us right now is, um, a culture of encounter. And what I mean by that, I'll kind of go into depth on that, but what I mean by that is just not being afraid to sit with our brothers and sisters in the LGBT plus community, to sit and listen, to hear stories, to hear their struggles, to meet them where they are. Obviously, again, we don't let people stay where they are. We don't let anybody, we don't let ourselves stay where we are. We're all needing to be pointing upwards and higher, but not being afraid nonetheless to encounter, um, to just have friendships with these individuals, to sit with them, to get to know them, to have conversations with them. I think um, so often Catholics, especially like we're so guilty of this, where we're like truth, like truth, truth. Like how I'm going to talk to them is I'm going to post on my Instagram story, the catechism quotes. And that is how I'm going to reach the LGBT plus communities. I'm going to let them know that they're called chastity and that's the end. And if they DM me saying they want to be chased, then great. I've done a good job. And if they don't, they're ignorant and they, you know, screw them and to hell with them. And it's like, no, like that's not, that's not the answer. That's not for, for any group, for any, that's not even how Jesus did. Like, yes, Jesus said, go and sin no more. If we look at the gospels, Jesus called individuals higher. He said very clearly, go and sin no more. That is a part of love. Love, if you look in Corinthians, does love does not rejoice in evil, but rejoices in the truth. So absolutely. 
truth has a place in love and love has a place in truth. But when you look at even Jesus' example in the Gospels, before he said go and sin no more, he sat with the woman. He listened. He met her. Like that is how to call people into truth, to call people higher. We first and foremost need to like be willing to encounter them. I, I heard this quote that was really beautiful where it was, for us to earn the right to be heard, we first and foremost have to hear others. And mm -hmm. it's kind of that we're like, first and foremost, for others to, to listen to us, to listen to the truth that we have to communicate as Catholics, especially regarding human sexuality, um, for them to actually know that we're communicating from a place of like care, they have to know that we care. They have to know right. that we care for them. Like that is first and foremost where it comes from. Like if you don't even get to know their name before you mention the name of Jesus, it's like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm almost like, where, where, is, where are the, where are the priorities there? Like, it's like, first and foremost, know the person, find Jesus in the person, let them know that you care, that you, that you love them. And then through that place of them knowing you care and love, they're going to know like Manny cares and loves about me enough. I know Manny, I'm confident in Manny's care and love for me. I'm confident in Amber's care and love for me enough that maybe I'm going to want to listen or going to want to hear what they have to say because I know it's coming from a place of genuine care because they've mm -hmm. taken the time to get to know and care for me first and foremost before getting into the Catholic stuff or before getting to the truth stuff. So I think first and foremost, just cultivating a deeper uh, culture of encounter and accompaniment within the church is um, something that we need. Just It's so vitally crucial um, that we need to just continue to foster within the church for our brothers and sisters in the LGBT plus community. I definitely agree. I think one of the most common things I see around, usually around the month of June is that people try to fix these people. They try to fix them as if they're some sort of inanimate object that's broken. Right. right. And it's like there is a level of fixing that needs to be done, you know, in the sense of maybe there's some emotional trauma there or something, but you can't just sit down and work on somebody. That's yeah. not how it works. And I always try to put myself in that person's shoes. I'm like, if some, if I was struggling with something, you know, I try to make it relevant to myself. Let's say I was really struggling with um, a breakup or, you know, a, a relationship issue or something. If somebody came to me and just started telling me what I should be doing without actually getting to know me or the situation first, right. why would I trust them? Why would I listen to them about anything? Right, I'm like, right. okay, clearly you don't know what you're talking about because you don't know me and everybody's an individual. Everybody's different. Right. And so that's really important. I'm glad you brought that up. I also know that, you know, these days there's a lot of misconceptions about the community, about same-sex attraction, what would you say is probably the most, like the number one misconception about same-sex attraction? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a lot of misconceptions. I mean, I can kind of, I'm just going to hit you some bullet points. Um, I think one of them that off the top of my head, I, I think I just feel convicted to like speak is that um, I think a lot of times we blanket or generalize that like, oh, anybody who has an LGBT plus experience, anybody who experiences same sex attraction, um, they have daddy wounds, they have mother wounds, they have emotional trauma, they were, you know, sexually abused, they were, you know, like, it's some kind of trauma linked thing, you know, um, I'm here to tell you, I have a wonderful relationship with my dad, I have a wonderful relationship with my mom, um, doesn't mean it's been perfect, but I love them both. And they look, they're some of my closest friends and some of my base supports. I love them both. Um, I'm very blessed that I was never sexually abused as a child. Um, none of the, like, I don't fit that mold. And I know a lot of people don't fit that mold. Doesn't mean that there isn't some validity, that there are some individuals who, you know, do have father wounds, do have mother wounds. But you know what? There are also individuals who don't experience same sex attraction, who also have father wounds and mother wounds or pure wounds or, you know, so it's like, I think one thing that's dangerous is the generalization that, oh, if this person, like, it's how we're going to get to the root of this is we're going to talk about their father wounds or their mother wounds. Mm -hmm. or we're going to send them a therapy. Like, First and foremost, I think what's important when it comes to that conversation is that the church is calling me to be holy through chastity. Um, the church is not necessarily calling me to go to therapy. The church is not calling me to be straight. The church is not calling, you know, because you know what the reality check is? I could be attracted to women. And I could still go to hell. Like I could have a it's wife. True. I could have a wife and I could send her and I both still to hell. That is not the end all be all. And I think sometimes we fixate on that of like, okay. Let's get to the root of homosexuality. Let's get to the root. Even though the catechism is very clear, it's it bl blank, like black and white. It says the origin of homosexuality is largely unknown. We don't know 
why people are attracted to the same sex. It's been around since people who times. If we knew, we would have fixed it by now. And I think one of the big misconceptions is like, we need to approach it from getting to the root where it's like, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, how I'm going to approach it is, no, I'm going to look at it. It's like, okay, this is an individual. How they got here isn't what matters to me. What matters to me is where they're going. And mm-hmm. I want them to get to heaven. And so how am I going to do that? How am I going to get them to heaven? How am I going to help them pursue sainthood? Through encouraging them in the virtue of chastity and the virtue of just all the virtues of, again, humility, of um, just, you know, perseverance, fortitude, all these gifts and the sacramental life and the church, friendship, you know, making myself available to them in that way. Um, I think that's a misconception. That, that's one of the misconceptions that we need to like box people and, you know, almost like diagnose them. Um, even though, again, also the church even says very clearly that the attractions themselves are not sinful. Um, it's what you do with them. Um, and so I think that's a misconception. I think another misconception is um, that the church is homophobic. Um, I would argue that the Catholic church is actually like the Catholic church is the only institution in the world that calls our brothers and sisters who have LGBT plus experiences into actual, authentic, real love, because right. that love has a name. It's Jesus Christ. And the Catholic church is the home of Jesus. The bride of Christ is like, that is the bride group. And so the Catholic church is not homophobic. Um, she's calling us into real authentic love. Um, are there people within the church who discriminate, who are bigoted, who are hateful? Yes, absolutely. And we can't ignore that. There are people in the church who have failed our brothers and sisters. There are people in the church who have hurt and wounded people, but the church herself and granted the church is her people. So like, yes, like the church in a way, but Jesus Christ at the center and his bride, like the church is not homophobic. We desire to like our brothers and sisters who experience same sex attraction have a place in our pews. They belong. We belong. You are part of the body of Christ. We are not afraid of you. We're not angry at you. At you. We don't hate you. We love you so much. Jesus loves you so much. And he desires a relationship with you through his church, through the sacraments of his church, through his people. Um, so that's another misconception, Amber, as well, that I would throw out there. No, I completely agree. And that is something that I've heard time and time again from people bringing up Sodom and Gomorrah to people bringing up, you know, Father James Martin to people bringing up like there's so much confusion going on these days. And I think it's hard to really find a good source. And Manny, I think you're that good source for people because you have this beautiful balance of understanding what they're going through, the pain, the struggle, because you yourself have gone through it and are going through it. But then also this truth that the church holds, but in a way that isn't going to scare people. And I think that's what's really important is that we we scare people, I think, sometimes because there's so much confusion and confusion causes fear and fear is not from God. And so, um, you know, you see these two sides, the church that calls, you know, people to be celibate and chaste and, you know, who struggle with SSA. And then you see the other side, of like the LGBTQ worldly communities who, you know, they have the parades and there's all of this stuff going on and there's drag queen story hour. And, you know, it's all, and there's these two sides and, you know, we really need to meet in the middle and we need to realize that there are some people who genuinely are, you know, perverted and are pedophiles and go after people and use the facade of, you know, having same sex attraction, or maybe they do have it, but, you know, there's always going to be bad people in any group. I mean, we see that in the church, we see that in Protestant um, denominations. So that can't really surprise us, but we really need to reach those people who truly are struggling and having that conversion of heart. And we need to reach the other people too. But I think, you know, it goes both ways. And I don't know if you would attest to this, but do you think it comes from a conversion of heart on their end and then we can reach out? Or do you think it could happen based off of how we handle a situation if somebody tells us they're struggling? Yeah, I mean, I mean, foremost, I that's a great question. I mean, obviously, like Jesus even made it clear that like, you know, if they don't listen, you know, brush the dust off your feet and go to the next town. Like Jesus, we can't beg anybody to believe like at the end of the Mm -hmm. day we can't force anybody to listen we can't force anybody to believe in the person of jesus christ um so like absolutely it goes both ways like absolutely there needs to be a receptivity um on their end as well their hearts need to be open to what we have to say absolutely um but with that i think what's important to note is um i think though so many of well just from what i've seen and just statistically even speaking Um, There's been a lot of hurt and a lot of damage and a lot of wounds between the church, between Christians 
and our brothers and sisters who experience same-sex attraction, there's been so much hurt that I think there's almost a defense where immediately they hear like, oh, you're a Catholic, you're a Christian. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put up a wall. I'm not going to listen to you because I know what you're about to say. I know what you're about to do. I don't want to go to conversion therapy. I don't want to do this. I'm not a project. Get Stay away from me. You know, like in a way, my empathetic heart looks at them and I'm like, I don't blame them for immediately coming into, just like for Catholics, sometimes we go into those spaces with an oh, automatic yeah. assumption, of, right? Of like, <laughs> I don't want you to push anything on me. Like I'm going to go to pride parade and I'm going to see like a bunch of people half naked. I don't want to see it. You know, like we all, all of us do this as human beings. We make assumptions. We have our defenses. We have our walls. Like we all do this on both sides on their side, or, you know, I don't want to say their side because that's an us versus them, but like on, you know, the side with like our brothers and sisters in the LGBT plus community, as well as our brothers and sisters within the church. Are probably, like we all do this. So it's a matter of, if anything, this is why as Catholics, if, through our witness, um, in the way, I do think in the way we respond, in the way we handle this topic, in the way we respond, definitely will create an atmosphere of them feeling like, you know, like if they will, I, I do think the way we respond will impact their openness. There are obviously mm-hmm. going to be individuals that, will not be open no matter what. And we can't do anything about that. No matter how kind I am, no matter how um, respectful I am, no matter how charitable I am, there are going to be people who are going to think I'm crazy, who are going to think I'm stupid, who are not going to agree with what I have to say. And I can't force anyone. Like I can't first force that person to listen to me. Um, but I do think there are some individuals that if they were received or responded to in a way that was more charitable, was more orthodox, was more Catholic than they initially had experience from whether it was a priest or their parents or whatever. I do think there might've been, you know, I, I do wonder like, what if like there was more charity in that moment? Like what, how those people were responding? I mean, I've even seen in my own ministry, I've had people from all over the world, from you countless DMS messages, emails of people being like, like you said, like hearing you and the way you speak about this, like it is so refreshing. It makes me want to look into the faith. It makes me want to be Christian. It makes me want to be cat. Like, it's evident to me that the way we present this, there is an impact. Um, mm. And I think even Jesus did display that too. I mean, Jesus was careful in the way he went about his public ministry as well. Like there was a tactic. There is a tactic in a sense of like, not that, again, not that they're projects and where they, but like a tactic in the sense of like, there is a way to go about love in a way that's truly loving. And there's a way to also fail in that. And I, I do think we can fail at that. And that will impact the way that individuals receive us or vice versa. Um, so... Yeah, I completely agree. I definitely, you know, charity is something that lacks on Catholic yeah. social media. I think, you know, we've all experienced <laughs> it. I have definitely in the last yeah. few days causing yeah. scandal, having yeah, articles yeah. written about me. We heard about this. Check the trending page. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, causing quite a scandal from my <laughs> modest mass outfit. <laughs> um, but I definitely think charity lacks in general. I mean, I think that is a grace that we are truly lacking. And it reminds me of this story. It doesn't have to do with the LGBTQ, but it, it reminds me of this story. I don't know if it's true or not, but a priest told me of it, where there were two altar boys, and um, one altar boy dropped, you know, the 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 wine. It wasn't blood of Christ yet, and the priest yelled at him, "Get him out of the church!" Like he wow. screamed at him, and he ran out. Mm-hmm. Then the second altar boy also dropped the wine, but the priest was like, oh, clean it up. You know, it's not the blood of Christ. Like we'll clean it up and then we'll like just do it again. And he was very kind. The first boy became Stalin and the second boy was Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Oh, wow. So I don't know how accurate that story is, but it's a story Mm. that's been going around for years. And so charity, kindness, understanding, and love are all really important. Mm. And love does not mean affirmation. And I think people need to understand that just because you love somebody and just because you are kind to somebody or you are charitable towards someone does not mean you are affirming their sin. Absolutely. And I think that's something we lose track of today. And so this has been a great conversation and just kind of wrapping it up to one last question. What would you say to those who are struggling with same-sex attraction or to those who have loved ones who struggle with same-sex attraction and they don't think they're strong enough to um, come out of it and to, to really seek help or, or, you know, talk about it even? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, great question, Amber. I'm going to first address those who might um, experience themselves and then I'll then address the loved ones. So um, if you're watching this and you experience same-sex attraction, you have an LGBT plus experience, um, I want you to know that the Catholic Church loves you, that God the Father loves you, that Jesus the Son loves you, that the Holy Spirit loves you, um, that Jesus desires intimacy with you, that Jesus wants a relationship with you, um, that He, you are a part of His flock, 
um, that you are not exempt from the call to sainthood. You're not um, any less qualified to be a saint, to be a Catholic, to be a Christian. Um, Jesus is calling you um, into goodness, into love um, through the Catholic Church, through her teachings on human sexuality, through her sacraments, through uh, the people of God, through community, um, that this is your home, that I see you, um, that the church sees you, and that you do belong. Um, again, it's not easy all the time, um, but sainthood isn't easy all the time. Um, that's why we need the Lord. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need the church. Um, but know that you're loved, you're seen, um, you are not dirty, you are not um, broken. You know, if anything, we're all broken, actually. We're all affected by sin. We it's all true. have, we all are broken. We all have our wounds. We all have our, our the thorns in our sides. We all have our crosses, but the Lord sees you in that. He desires to place his hands on you um, and bring restoration, bring love, bring um, just freedom. And I, I, through the virtue of chastity, through the all the virtues, through grace. Um, and th so I just, I, I'm here to tell you that you're loved, you're seen, you're wanting, you're known, and you're good. Um, and then if you have a loved one or you know someone who experiences same sex attraction, especially someone who's maybe left the church or somebody who's walked away from the faith, um, I'm just here to tell you to have hope. Um, I was that kid. I was the kid who was off on the other end. Um, and I cannot emphasize enough how important intercession is. My mom, my dad, my grandparents, my godparents were praying so fervently for me. So many rosaries, so many masses. And I firmly believe that their intercession played a role in my coming home. Do not stop praying for your loved ones. Do not stop interceding for your friends, for your family members. Like God, the Lord hears, the Lord answers. Your prayers are not wasted. Keep praying for conversion. Keep praying for them to come home. Keep praying for your own conversion that you as well continue to be made new in the Lord. Continue to pray that you continue to be equipped with what you need. And then finally, um, just try your best to maintain a relationship with them. I know that looks hard and that can be difficult at times, especially if it really is like they make it their whole identity and all they want to talk about is their relationship and this, that. But like, it's ironic that as Catholics, oftentimes we say, you know, like, you're more than this. You're more than your sexuality. Your identity is more than that. But yet all we sometimes fix it on when it comes to relationships is like, oh, like what, like they're, all they're going to talk about is the gay. All they're going to talk about is this. But it's like, if we truly believe that they are a whole person, that they're, you know, all of us are more than our sexuality, then invest in those other parts of them, get to know them, like get to know mm -hmm. their story, their own faith, their own relationship with God, their interests, their hobbies, their friends, their, you know, like there's so much to that human person. So invest in that human person, foster a relationship with that human person. The last thing we should do, and I think the most harmful thing we can do is immediately just cut them off or kick them out or cut that that cord. If anything, like we might be the only Bible they might read. Um, and so be the Lord to them, be a beacon, try your best to maintain that relationship and don't lose hope. The Lord is merciful. He's faithful. I'm here to testify to it. And yeah, just believe so. No, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Manny, for coming on, sharing your testimony and being so brave and being able to reach those who we can't, you know, or who we feel you know, like we can't reach. And I think these will give great tips for us so that, you know, we can reach these people and that we can hopefully, you know, show them that they are loved, you know, and hopefully they will come into the church. But if not, you know, still obviously realizing that they are people and they have souls and God loves them. Yeah. And so um, it's just such a beautiful story. So I, I thank you so much for coming on. And I put your link tree in the description for anyone who wants to go follow Manny. But um, did you just want to give a quick shout out where you are just so people know? Yeah, where yeah, you. Amber. So thank you, everybody who has been listening. Um, I ask first and foremost, please pray for me. I always say like, you don't have to follow me. You don't have to bring me into your parishes. At the end of the day, just pray for me because the enemy does not like what the Lord is doing here. So please pray for me. Um, and then along with praying for me, if you would like to follow me on my journey, um, you can follow me on Instagram at call me Manny um, with two extra Y's at the end of Manny. So three Y's total. Um, you can also visit my website. Um, what a beautiful cross. So if you Google search, like what a beautiful cross, Manny Gonzalez, um, my website will come up on there. You can contact me if you'd like to bring me in to speak as well as just see my other resources, see where else I've spoken, you know, watch my videos, things like that. Um, yeah. And you can also on YouTube, if you look me up or on my link tree, I have different videos as well that you'll be able to find. Um, yeah, but first and foremost, just pray for me. And then if you'd like to follow me along the journey, I'd love to go on this adventure with you. So 
Thank you. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you so much, Manny. I really appreciate it. And I hope you guys all learned something. I hope that this will help you in case you struggle with SSA or maybe you know somebody who does. Hopefully this will give you um, some insights, some tips in order to kind of start a conversation and get something going there. But with all that being said, I hope you guys have a blessed rest of your day and I'll